We will stand on principle, or we will not stand at all. Hello everyone, this is Thierry Aris uh, here for another episode of Principal Discord. This time we are with Michel Girardin. Michel, how are you doing? I'm fine. Hello Thierry. So uh, tell us more about yourself, a uh, quick introduction. Yes, so, um, I teach uh, economics and finance at the University of Geneva. And I also have my own uh, uh, consultancy firm where I provide uh, macroeconomic analysis uh, and implications for financial markets. I actually have this passion for studying uh, uh, financial markets and economic history. Uh, just now I'm, I'm finishing a book on the recurrence of financial crisis and I'm mostly interested in uh, why is it that we always make the same mistakes that mm -hmm. trigger these financial crises and uh, how we can uh, solve uh, the, this problem and maybe how uh, a central bank digital currencies or digital currencies can help uh, increase uh, financial stability. You will be speaking uh, broadly about the implications of CBDCs and central banks. Um, so the first question I want to ask you is, for a, for a central bank who wants to implement a CBDC, um, what would be your perspective on terms of the challenges and the opportunities that there is in implementing mm -hmm. such a thing? Mm -hmm. Uh, CBDCs have now come into top gear uh, within central banks. Uh, they were, uh, should I say, um, it came as an innovation. It started in the private sector right. uh, with the events of the, the Libras and the like. And then it came to central banks, but it was mostly a reaction to them, to that they see that a lot of these uh, 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 private firms are developing initiatives uh, uh, going digital. Mm. And so the central banks reacted to that to say, we want money to remain sovereign. We want to keep control of it. Right. The first central bank that uh, really uh, went uh, uh, and digged deep into the question of uh, digital currencies was the Bank of Sweden. Indeed, the first central bank ever, mm. 17th century. And they uh, came with this uh, white papers and studying the, the events of, of creating a digital uh, corona. Mm. Then other banks uh, moved and now 60% of the, of the world central banks are, are deeply interested in, uh, in digital currencies. Uh, the uh, central bank of China uh, started just now uh, a, 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 to implement its uh, digital currency. Uh, what are the, uh, the driving forces to make a, a, a CBDC successful? Uh, well, it certainly helps uh, facilitate uh, uh, payments, uh, transactions. So we talk about a wholesale CBDC that would enable banks to interact more efficiently, mm -hmm. reduce the costs of transaction, increase the speed of transactions, uh, increase also transparency, uh, where you can uh, you can follow all the, the transaction in a, in a more uh, uh, practical way uh, going digital um, so these are uh, there are many uh, 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 success factors for uh, for um, uh, CBDCs but there are also many many challenges yeah. and uh, one of the challenges is clearly to see how uh, uh, implementing a digital currency will not violate privacy rights. Right. Um, another issue is uh, financial inclusion. Uh, basically now the Central Bank of Sweden has stepped back a little bit from this project saying that maybe it's not such a good idea to go digital uh, because we're not sure that uh, at some point we get maybe a technical problem and people cannot access cash. Right. Um, so it's, it's, it's moving clearly in this direction and certainly a boosting factor that has uh, now uh, made central banks really interested in, in this project is COVID-19. Right. Clearly now the, the use of cash is, uh, is uh, disappearing uh, fast. In countries like Sweden already some, some shops uh, say uh, cash okay. n not accepted mm. uh, and increasingly it's becoming the, the trend. 
So yes, the, the trend towards uh, digital is, uh, is clearly there. I mean, it seems like a natural evolution, right? You see already checks that have completely gone in many countries in the Western world, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and in Asia and Africa, uh, even they're, they're leapfrogging a lot of, a lot of those things. Um, let's, let's step back a little bit with the, with the principles of the central bank problems that we are facing now as a whole. Um, because at the moment we can't say that they're following unorthodox poli policies uh, and so I guess you as a lecturer also in macroeconomics you, you, you touch on those subjects uh, how do you see this evolving? The, the policies of the central banks uh, have become as you say unconventional after the, the subprime crisis they first uh, used the conventional tools of interest rates and when these interest rates touched the lower bound of zero percent mm. they went slightly negative right. indeed they are negative now in switzerland in the eurozone in japan um, but they cannot go much lower than that so clearly the central banks now have become very innovative and they are doing this unorthodox monetary policies of asset of purchasing assets mm -hmm. of monetizing the debt this right. is what they're doing uh, so the whole system now rests on, the, on, on a very fragile equilibria whereby the central banks is actually purchasing a lot of the government bonds the right. bond that which are being issued to get us out the, the corona recession. And it's basically in the hands of the central bank to purchase all these bonds and keep those interest rates low. And right. so to keep the servicing of the debt as low as possible and make the whole thing sustainable. But this is a tricky balance because basically we're putting ourselves in the hands of the central bank right. to ensure a, a financial so, stability. So that's, that's one uh, observation, right? Is that uh, you, you can argue that central banks always n have been monetizing the debt basically and, 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 and a lot of questions are raised when, when it comes to the independence of central banks to the government. So mm. it seems like it becomes increasingly obvious, right? That, that there is a need for central banks to to do that and, and, and in a way you also see money being politicized, right? Both mm. from the side of the dollar, from the side of China and internally in the markets from the side of government debts. So talking about po politicizing money, right? right. Um, we see a currency wars uh, pl playing in history every now and then mm -hmm. and sometimes those currency wars turn into trade wars and mm -hmm. sometimes those trade wars can turn into real wars so mm -hmm. where do you see us in the evolution there and do you think we can avoid that in the, if you study the history of, of monetary economics you find that uh, the world has some uh, uh, currency that serves as the world's reserve currency uh, but there are cycles mm. typically a cycle for a currency to serve that role maybe lasts about a century mm. and then it changes uh, for a long time it was uh, the sterling uh, in the uk and since 1920 it's been the dollar mm. but the dollar huh, is becoming a bit of a problematic currency indeed since uh, nixon removed the peg to the to gold in mm. 1971 the dollar has been on a steady decline right it was worth four francs 30 uh, back in the Bretton woods uh, yep. system of stable currencies uh, fixed uh, uh, pegs and now it's uh, gone to parity with the Swiss franc so it's lost a lot of value uh, the dollar being the reserve currency gives uh, an exorbitant privilege to the US to, to basically do whatever they want with their debt you know mm -hmm. the people know that they have to, they're gonna have to use dollars so we clearly need now an alternative to the dollar and this was so do you think we need an alternative to the dollar indeed we, d we do yes so what would be that alternative well currently the euro serves as as uh, the number two okay. uh, a reserve currency the second one in the international trade and clearly if the euro does not go digital by 2025 i would say mm. uh, it will be overtaken by the digital yuan uh, mm. You know, they're doing the Belt and Road Initiatives. That's right. This is a huge project, infrastructure project. Uh, obviously, they will finance it with the Yuan. For sure. And uh, so the digital version of the Yuan will be in use. So if we don't want to be, you know, uh, uh, not, part in, not in the game uh, and be outside the, 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 the trade uh, uh, flows, 
we have to also uh, come with a digital solution. Right. Well, if I, if I may, I want to touch on two points here. The first one is that you're right that maybe the euro is is being pushed to do their own digital currency. I think the euro problem is is kind of like the Kissinger problem, right? Uh, but in this time that you cannot put 27 people agreeing on the table. Right. Uh, and so uh, talking about China, the Ming yeah. dynasty had the chain uh, strategy. And the chain strategy is to let your opponent have as many alliances as possible so that they become uh, immobile. Mm. They cannot take a charter mm. course mm. And, and make a decision. And it seems like the US is, is somewhat, since the Marshall Plan, somewhat in control also of what's happening in Europe. Right. So I see more USA and China and then the Belt and Road Initiative very in interesting because on the one side you have the commercial aspect uh, deeply dependent on China and the debt aspect deeply dependent on some mm. of the IMF or some international aid and some debt with international banking system legacy right right uh, touching upon it, alternatives and you know you, you were speaking about gold of course uh, <laughs> I, I, I like gold I studied gold a, lo a lot mm -hmm. um, I think it starts actually since 1930s uh, with Truman, where the, 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 the genuine unpeg of gold was, but it was really actually completely off and totally fiat from Nixon in 71 for sure. Right. But, and then if you see from 1920s to now, it's 98% cents on the dollar. So I don't see currencies as one against the other, like you, you, you said the dollar versus the Swiss franc. Uh, I, see, I see money as gold mm -hmm. and all other fiat against gold meaning $35 an ounce for the Bretton Woods system right. and now 1800 right so right. that that the currencies them both of them appearing to go fluctuating but really mm -hmm. all going down mm -hmm. uh, that's one the, the second side is when it comes to alternative it seems to me that bitcoin is the private sector initiative mm -hmm. that comes because there is a need of fixing the problems that uh, let's say legal tender money uh, has uh, has created and so it was it was this need that the market tried to fix mm. I think wrongly by creating a another sort of fiat mm -hmm. which to me is because with the perk that you cannot print it as much right so I, I obviously have my own private initiative ba based on gold but looking at alternatives do you think it's going to come from the private sector and will that win the race of currencies over the long term hmm. or will it stay deeply regulated knowing that the swiss national bank the federal reserve and most western banks are actually private sector mm -hmm. so how do you see things pan out right now because the pboc is clearly public Right, and, and they are more of a control directional hmm. issue, and maybe the other ones are facing that problem where they would like to stay as they are, but the markets are pushing it towards yeah. something else. Clearly, yes, you can see that we're exactly what you're saying. The market is pushing the central banks to act or to react. Right. I would say if we hadn't had the Libra or COVID-19, right. maybe we wouldn't have all the discussion with CBDCs. Right. Or the, and the need to go digital. They would say, what, what's that going to change? It's not going to mm. change the way we uh, issue money, mm. the way we set monetary policies. Uh, one thing that might change, actually, going digital in terms of, s is not actually a very good one. <laughs> the privacy one. The privacy one is, is clearly an issue, but also just talking of from a monetary policy perspective, if you go digital, you open the door to what we call financial repression. Financial repression okay. is when you penalize the savers, and it's very actual. Well, we've seen that since, since we, 2009, yeah. pretty much. Huh? Yeah, but financial repression is very low interest rates, so the savers don't get the returns on their savings. Right. But, uh, but now we can go even negative. Right. We are indeed ne slightly negative. The, bond, the government bond yields in Switzerland are, sure. are, are negative, but we can get, go even more. And mm. indeed, I talked to some central bankers, and they say, Oh, what else can we do? Maybe we could p set uh, interest rates at minus four. You know, right. we have some things, a thing called Taylor rule, which we use as monetary yeah. economy. We, we look at where inflation is, where growth is in relation to Employee potential output and, and uh, the target of the central bank in terms of inflation. 
And depending on where we are relative to, to these two uh, objectives, we, we say, okay, interest rates should be. And currently, the Taylor rule is, is telling us it's that interest rates should be at minus 3%. Correct. So if the money is not digital, and you have the ability to get the cash, and the central bank puts interest rates at minus three, mm. what you do is you go to the bank, you take the cash, and you put it in a safe, right? right? You don't want to pay the tax. Yeah, I, yeah, if the money is digital, what do you withdraw? What do you put in the vault? Well, we're gonna we're gonna touch on the on the on those principles too, because what happens is, first of all, do you want? Uh, so there is two questions here. Do you want? a CBDC in terms of principle how you work because if you want to use blockchain maybe it's not the right fit as a technology for a centralized mm. counterparty where if you want to decentralize it maybe it makes more sense uh, that's the first question and the second one is what are the implications if you do control if you keep the control over monetary policy if you keep the control over uh, all sorts of things because that can allow you to do negative interest rates, mm. to do MMT, okay, because there's another way also. Right. You keep interest rates at zero, but you just print more of the outstanding yeah. monetary mass. Mm. Uh, so is it really a fit for them to be using that technology or are they not shooting themselves in the foot? Because that would be the entry point of people demanding decentralized money over the long term. Uh, I think clearly the will for central banks to move into this direction of going digital uh, is to keep control right. of the money issuance. Uh, and this is clearly what has displeased the Central Bank of Sweden, which was the first one to start studying the implementation of a CBDC. Right. They see that oh, people are just using, they're not using cash anymore. Cash is disappearing fast in Sweden. Mm -hmm. they, uh, you see people even uh, putting the, a chip under their skin, right, right. so they pay their tickets in, in the train uh, and you have the controller coming and, and <laughs> reading that from under your skin. Yeah, the conspiracy you know? holes are going to be <laughs> yeah, <honest. so> Well, <laughs> right. uh, uh, but and then so they saw that and they say we cannot leave the, the, the all the, the, the money which is being used to pay, you know, for your daily transactions uh, in the hands of private firms who are profit seeking. Uh, can but you let me trust you again? Central banks, for the most part, are private as well. So, what is the yeah private? I mean, the, the Swiss National Bank is quoted on the, on exactly. the uh, uh, as listed on the really stock well market. The balance but sheet has increased pretty much, right? I wouldn't so say that it's a private enterprise. I mean, what is it then? It, because, well, I tell you why it's not a private uh, enterprise. Because if it was one, truly one, uh, already twice in in it in its histories, it would have been bankrupt. So At some point, a, it had negative equity. So, so when it was intervening, they are in bed with the government. It's like a bailout, but uh, before it they, was cool. They they are in charge of issuing money, of conducting monetary policy. They are not profit seeking. They can have negative equity, but they do make profits. And, well, sometimes they do, but it's not their goal. It's not their goal. <laughs> now, well, the, stock, the Swiss the, stock the Swiss National Bank. Right? Well, the Swiss National Bank is the most aggressive central bank in the world. Right. In, if you compare the size of the balance sheet to Some GDP, people are even asking for dividends now. Yeah. Okay. So they have 120 percent. The equivalent of Switzerland's GDP right. is is the balance sheet is of the. Is there not a moral hazard there? Well, they they obviously need to. They have all these assets. They bought. They buy. They're buying euros like mad uh, just right. to prevent to the pay. Swiss franc to to overshoot and go back to parity vis-a-vis -vis right. the euro. So they're keeping it at 107, 108. Obviously, they would love it if they could go back to 120 or even right. above. But, it, but that's not going to work. It never works. The pegs never work. The peg, well, the peg worked actually. No, the floor works at some point. I don't know Over why the they. I don't the know why they, they. I don't know why they removed it because now it's basically uh, they have to spend. They have to purchase euros. In, in right. when the floor was there, they could just threaten. They could just say, "We're there." If somebody wants to buy Swiss franc, and but over the long term, do pegs work? You've uh, seen in Argentina. You've seen it in Hong Kong. You've seen it in many a other places, according to my peg, knowledge. It depends on, on who, who, which, which currency you peg yours to. In the case of Argentina, uh, you peg the, 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 to the dollar. Uh, so when the dollar appreciates, you're 
peso right. appreciates along and it kills the export industry. That's what killed uh, Argentina, it kills also some uh, countries uh, in Asia back in, in the 90s. So it really depends. But here we're talking about a very strong, actually the strongest currency in the world, the Swiss franc, the most overvalued in relation to its uh, purchasing power parity value. And we're, we're not pegging. First, it's not a peg. It's, it was a quasi peg. It's okay. just a, 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 a limit right. above which you don't want to, to, to see the, the Swiss franc appreciating. So I, th I actually was a bit surprised that they removed the, the, the floor. I think I don't think they did it because they wanted to. It's because they were in certain They were scared. Capacity. I talked to the, 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 uh, the vice chairman of the Swiss National Bank then, right. Jean-Pierre Dantin, who was my professor at University of Lausanne and the director of my thesis, my PhD. Yeah. So I have a good connection with Jean-Pierre and he talked to me and he, he got scared. He did some back of the envelope estimation of what it would cost the Swiss National exactly. Bank if they would keep on buying all, purchasing all these euros. And I told him, yeah, but you're gonna remove the floor. You're gonna have to purchase it even more. And this is what they're doing since then, since they removed the floor the size of the balance sheet has actually increased. Well, that's, that's also due to a lot of things, but I agree with you uh, anyways. But uh, from, from that perspective, would you agree with me that two different countries with two different economies should not have the same currency? Yeah, All right. clearly. So from yeah. that perspective, that means even the euro is nonsensical. It's a political project and it's not an economical project. Clearly, clearly. The, right. the, yeah, the clearly, uh, it, the system is half baked, as Margaret Thatcher used to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's not, it cannot work until we create this fantastic vision that Victor Hugo had. Uh, and when he said uh, back here uh, last uh, in the 19th century, he said, uh, we, we need to create uh, the United States of Europe. We need to have a model in Europe that works just like Switzerland, a confederation of states okay. where you have uh, incomes, uh, taxes, which are levied at the confederation level, at the cantonal level, and at the communal level. We need that in Europe. Until we have, a s we cannot well, have a stable it. euro right. with one central bank and, as you said, 27 finance minister. Right. They meet each month at the euro group, but they just talk. They just talk. There's right. no way you can... And the problem we have in Europe is that if at some point we need to help uh, civil servants in Greece or the banking sector in Spain, we need to ask permission to the German taxpayers. Right. Are you willing to get the, your money well, and, and help the Greek uh, citizens or the Spanish or the Portuguese should, one? Should the whole thing be there on the first place? I mean, because you're talking about Switzerland and, you know, like I, I, I like the Swiss system much better because of the direct democracy. It doesn't seem yeah. to me that uh, Europe has the perfect democracy right now as a, as a whole. So I think there is many yeah. more problems than just you know, consolidation. Yeah, but one there's, there's problem is that it's right? actually the United States were created like that to just uh, uh, make uh, cancel the debts of the different states and mutualize the debts. Right. Uh, indeed, if we, if you look at, uh, I looked at the differences of wealth of income uh, per capita in the different cantons of Switzerland or the different states of of the U.S. There's actually more differences within these cantons, across these the Swiss cantons or across uh, states in the U.S. Okay. between the richest state, which uh, state in the U.S., which is Washington D.C., and and the poorest one, which is Mississippi. There's more income discrepancy uh, than say between Germany and Greece. Right. right so right. it's not a question of really, you know, countries being really different. It's just a question, as you said, of political will. Do you do? We are not asking the taxpayers in Zug, which is the richest, the wealthiest uh, canton in Switzerland, whether they agree that their money, uh, their tax money, uh, it, it can be used to help uh, peasants in, in the Jura, which is the poorest country, canton, where I come from. A <laughs> yeah, good thing that you come yeah. from there so you can insult it. <laughs> so right? I get the money. And, and the taxpayers in Zug, nobody's asking them, are you okay if we can use some of the money you paid for your taxes? to help uh, 
the peasants in, in or, the, or the wine uh, producers in Valais, which is the second uh, poorest uh, canton in Switzerland. Yeah. You just take the money, we call this péréquation financière in French, so redistribution, and, and we, we reallocate. We're here and in this the is land of Rousseau in Geneva. Uh, we have a statue of Rousseau. Yeah. I live in Zurich. Uh, there is no statue of Voltaire over there, but I think the spirit is there. Um, let's go back to central bank digital currencies and their implication. You are now the head of a central bank at the SNB. What would you do? Um, ooh, that's a good one. Um, well, I would certainly um, talk to my colleagues at the BIS, uh, which is actually a fantastic place to get information on what all the central banks are doing and they yeah. meet each month in Basel. So this is a fantastic opportunity we have yeah. here with the Bank of for International Settlements where you can really discuss even informally and, and see how other peoples are moving. Because we may not be have to build the same uh, central bank digital currencies. One big concern and what I would have if I were at the helm of the Swiss National Bank is I would not want to crowd out the, the clients the system from the banking sector. Basically I would not want to destroy your own economy. To destroy sense. yes exactly and, and if at one point you have a digital currency which is issued by the central bank People will want and that one, rather than yeah, the one and another one issued by some mm, a Mastercard or even some some bank or some private initiative like we have Tencent or Alibaba in in China. Like, yeah, okay. uh, I don't want to. People say, ah, if there's if I want to keep one currency, I, I take the one from the central bank. Clearly, this one will never fail. Is is not so. I don't want to have to look at all the clients of UBS, Credit Suisse, even if they merge into a single bank. You know this. Right. Is, you know I don't want to get that. So this is clearly a, a problem I well, want well, to so address. Different people want to get different things. Okay, yeah. but is it not that more competition on money is better? Uh, competition on on building a digital currency you mean it could be just uh. as much as coming from the private sector from right. the public sector I think the principle we need to establish because I am I'm here in Switzerland and the thing that worries me at night is are we or are we not in a free market okay mm. it's really top-down mm, mm, mm. thinking of you and if we are in a free market then why is it that the most important price which is the price of money Mm. is not decided by the free market but by but by central banks and even mm. the long bond is decided by central banks Indeed. nowadays so it yeah. seems to me we are not in a free market okay and if we're going down that path then we can end up with a cu currency like in china mm. where they can cut you out mm. of the swift system okay mm -hmm. like the americans do sometimes mm -hmm. uh, they can unbank you and they can decide on whether you're banked or unbanked they can decide on whether you have privacy or not, uh, things like that. That is what mm. worries me. And then sometimes yeah. you see a big trend since basically the, the economic, the great economic crash that we see in 2008. Mm. Institutions as a whole have lost their trust and their reputation. Mm. I see that trend and I see Bitcoin is playing into that as well because it's also playing on the trust of money and the trust of the institutions that, that follow the money. And those who are in the banking, in the financial sector, they also care about those things. Mm. And they look at this as, as a free market opportunity to have money. So some people think of gold, right? Some people think of cash. Mm. Uh, but the problem today with Bitcoin is that it came uh, and to me it did one good thing, which is ask the question, what is money? Mm. What is it supposed to be? And how is it supposed to run? Mm. And I see that in the long term, I hope that we will have a separation of money and the state, just as we saw a separation of money and religion. Mm. Okay, and I think that's the movement now. Mm -hmm. And that I believe coming from the free market is unstoppable. Mm -hmm. Right now, the force that would try to prevent that is the central banking cartel, if you want to call it like that. Right. Um, yeah. 
And, and, and so, so you believe trust, in uh, which is the key uh, element Absolutely. for a money to, to exist. Uh, you can have trust in, in, a, in, a, in a currency, uh, even if there's no central bank or government behind it? I think in, I believe it was in the 1600s where you had private banks and then also looking back, uh, ah. uh, Frederick Hayek yeah. was talking about private money mm. uh, issued by private banks with different, uh, different trusts, different qualities and yeah. therefore competing. I mean, it, there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah. The euro is competing with the dollar, the yen, right. the, the, the sterling and everything. So yeah. why not leave it to others, sure. right? And then and then And indeed, the money were, came long before central banks were right. created. It, it, was, it, was, yeah. uh, it was private banks holding But I paper. if you think of the origins of central bank, like for the Riksbank, the Bank of Sweden, and then the Federal Reserves also beginning of uh, last century, the prime reason why they were created was not to, to issue a, a currency and, and control the money supply. It was basically to avoid bank runs. Mm. Uh, we had a, a banking crisis in the US in the late 19th uh, century, uh, two major ones that were actually in magnitude even bigger than the Great Depression mm. in the 30s. Yeah, because they let the depression run. Yeah. And so, yeah, and, and banks, as you know, they have leverage. They only uh, keep uh, a fraction of all the deposits which are, they get from, from, from uh, the, their clients right. and, they, and they make uh, uh, 10 times uh, money circulation from these deposits. So if everyone, if at some point you fear that the bank is going to fail, go bankrupt, you rush to the bank, you're going to be the first one to get your cash out because you know there's not enough for everyone. So if you don't have a central bank that acts as a lender of last resort and provides liquidity to the banking sector, then you get these bank runs where you get all the dominoes uh, falling yeah. and the system collapsing altogether. So my question is, I can live with the idea that trust does not have to be uh, enacted and insured by a central bank or a government. It certainly helps if you know that the piece of paper you have in your wallet uh, has this, you know, uh, some sovereign stamp on it that you know you can use it even if, if the bank is no longer in use it, you can go to the central banks and, and change it for a new, for a new currency. Um, okay. But I can live with the idea that maybe if we're living with Libras and, and, CB and, and not CBDCs or digital currencies like Bitcoins, Ethereum and the likes, uh, it can be trusted even though it's not a centralized or a system. Uh, but if I have to uh, say where do I feel more confident, if there is a fear of a bank run, would I prefer to have a system which is sovereign with a central bank behind it, or could it be uh, a private system with Libras and Bitcoins and the like? Then clearly I would opt for the, for the former. I would opt for a sovereign system because uh, yeah, Facebook, uh, what, I, what, what's yeah. the, why would Facebook be willing at some point to save a, a bank, no, uh, I, a I, banking I, system, which might be its competitor? I, <laughs> I, I agree, but the thing is the choice needs to remain there, meaning you need to be other people you need to allow competition mm. because otherwise you would not see progress right as a as a principle mm -hmm. so it doesn't mean that i like libra i actually don't like libra okay but uh but it doesn't mean i don't want it to exist yeah right yeah. um and i think overall you will see um free competition of money regardless right through moneros and others um, and eventually the, the idea would be that the best currency would win. Mm -hmm. And the question would be, what is that best currency? So it, trying to wrap up, um, do you have any message for our audience? My message is um, I'm very interested in financial crisis. And as I mentioned, I'm doing this book now on, uh, on how to avoid the next financial crisis. So 
I question whether the, go the move towards digital would actually improve financial stability. And the answer is, I'm not sure, actually. Just wh what I said, you know, avoiding bank runs, which is the prime mission, the original mission of central banks, is best ensure if we keep uh, central banks in play and we do not go fully digital. I also use I also like to use cash. Basically, I don't really feel confident in knowing that uh, all my transactions from the first coffee in the morning to the last cocktail early morning <laughs> is tracked by some authority right. and, and knows that they know everything I'm doing. I don't really like this world. So I would say on the, on the last note that prudence is a good word and that most likely the idea here is to not go fully digital 100% directly, but rather see and get more options, keeping cash alive, because Indeed. you never know you might use it. Indeed. Okay. Keep thank ca you. Keep cash alive. <laughs> That's right. Okay. So thank you very much, everybody. If you like this video, if you like this interview, follow us, like uh, us. Also follow uh, Michel Girardin. He has a book coming up uh, soon, so uh, he will let you know when, when that is out. Thank you.